now. Okay, well, welcome everybody. This is our second meet meeting for the Film Scoring Network. Um, I hope you all are doing well. There's a lot of you, which is exciting. There's 30 something of you. So it's really nice to see everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker this week. His name's Peter Mansfield. Um, if you can wave, then everybody can see you. There you are. I'm gonna make you bigger so that I can. Do you know how to make him? We can speak of you. Speaker view. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> now I see you. Um, yeah, so I'm introducing Peter Mansfield. We're going to be interviewing him today. Um, we met when I was a waitress, and he, uh, when I talked a lot about music, and we had some topics because you know I was mentioned that I was a composer, and and he was in that field. So a year later, probably even more, here we are, and he's interviewing with us. And yeah, I'm really excited that you guys get to meet him. So if you wanted to just give yourself a quick brief introduction and talk about maybe, you know, a little bit about your career and kind of what you focus on and some of your kind of main lines of work. Sure, sure. First of all, hope you guys are all doing well, staying safe and healthy as, as is so frequently said these days. Um, it's a pretty crazy time. I was saying to Lauren yesterday, none of us have any experience with any of this, so it's reinventing our expectations and selves every day. Anyway, it's great to see you all. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I began my uh, career um, uh, shortly after uh, graduating from college. Um, I went to Harvard College in Cambridge, Mass. You've probably heard of it. Despite that, I decided to go into being a professional musician. Um, and uh, I had, uh, got a job uh, two years after I graduated that I was completely unqualified for, which was uh, being the assistant conductor and arranger for a show at Harvard called the Hasty Pudding Show. Um, and uh, which for many, many years was uh, an all male cast, the uh, female parts dressed in drag. And uh, that is no longer the case. The Hasty Pudding Show is now fully uh, co-educational. But in any case, I, I had to do a lot of learning on the job. I had a wonderful mentor and arranger and orchestrator from New York um, who was the principal uh, arranger for the Boston Pops at the time. And uh, so I got to know people at the Boston Pops and uh, got my first job playing piano at the Boston Pops in 1986, I wanna say. I was telling Lauren on the phone yesterday, talk about pressure. I walked in uh, to play piano and the conductor was John Williams, uh, who was in his early days as music director of the Boston Pops. Not too intimidating to play for, um, for uh, John Williams, just kidding, totally intimidating, as lovely a man as, as he was and is. Um, and I got, uh, I got, uh, forced into doing some uh, arranging and orchestrating work for him because there was a television series going on at the, si at the time on PBS called Evening at Pops, which no longer exists, but they had uh, guest artists coming in on a weekly basis and uh, John approached me and asked if I could do a quick orchestration for one of the guest artists who had brought in a, an arrangement that was unplayable by the Boston Pops, just not well written. So I uh, uh, ran outside and threw up and then uh, because I'd never done anything for uh, the Boston Pops so certainly not for John Williams but anyway fast forward I've, I've wound up staying largely in the symphony orchestra business I, I studied uh, and learned conducting and have done a lot of, of guest conducting around the country um, I've been lucky enough to just have a variety of different kinds of projects, which I was telling Lauren has been very important to me because I, I really wanted to be able to work in this business. And I figured if I could get skills in a variety of different areas, I'd have a fighting chance of, of maintaining some sort of a, a career. And it, and it has really worked out pretty well. More recently, I, uh, taught for 15 years at Berkeley, well, at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley in the theater division, so I've, th there's been a lot of musical theater focus to my career in the last 15 years. Um, but I've continued, thankfully, to be able to conduct and arrange on the symphony level. So that's that. I, I was telling Lauren, I apologize to you guys, I really am not a film score person, other than having worked a little bit with John Williams, but 
Um, most of that work was around his uh, position as conductor of the Boston Pops. So my work with him was on the symphony end of things and not so much the film end of things, but you guys are all whiz bang, high tech film scoring people. And uh, in as much as I'm, I'm tech savvy, I haven't done almost any film scoring uh, per se in the way that most of you guys are probably doing it. So uh, that's, that's my disclaimer. Um, but anyway, that's the, uh, probably not short enough, but that's the short story of, of what's been happening with me. Thank you so much. Yeah, the reason, and I'll explain to everybody, you know, I mean, you don't need an explanation, obviously, because you've done a lot of really great things with your career, but, you know, we, we spend a lot of time interviewing film composers and a lot of people kind of just in the same wheelhouse. And, and while those people have lots of valuable things to say, um, we're really interested in learning about other skill sets that really do contribute to our field, you know, composing, conducting, and arranging are, even for film or not for film, are all, um, qualities that makes a really well-rounded successful composer because everybody here wants to be a composer um, everybody here wants to be involved in the industry and this you know most people don't have a plan b and so i think something that's really great about your career is that you have this really well-rounded set of skills and so which brings me into my next question which you know you kind of talked about your main skills being arranging composing and conducting and i was wondering if you could speak on each of those skills and kind of talk about you know what about those skills makes you so useful in the industry and what about those skills has enabled you to have a career with them? Sure. Well, Lauren, you and I talked about this yesterday as well too. I think that um, one of the really most important things to understand about arranging and orchestrating and conducting is that we can study those disciplines up to a point, right? You can, you can take uh, classes, study with texts, uh, study online. But the fact of the matter is all three of those skill sets really come into play and you become proficient once you're lucky enough to be able to get out into the field and do them. Um, I think there are professions out there where you can study and get advanced degrees and, and sort of jump into the workforce right away. Uh, medicine or law or some aspects to business. But, you know, you can, you can study arranging, but until you actually start arranging yourself and hearing the work that you've done, you really won't go high up on the learning curve until that happens. I, I can sure tell you it's true with conducting. Uh, I studied conducting for about a year and a half with two private teachers, both of them terrific teachers. But my word, when I got up in front of my first orchestra, which happened to be the San Diego Symphony in California, and it's a long story as to why that happened, but I was not ready for it and I was pushed into it by a last minute illness. You've all heard the story, the person who gets a job because the, their mentor gets sick but it was a frightening experience. And, and um, so I, I guess I would say that, that yes, studying the craft is important, but if you're lucky enough to have opportunities to practice your craft and hear and see what you're doing, that's where you're really gonna learn in this, in this business. And, um, and I think that uh, that's a tricky needle to thread because you, you do an arrangement and you'd like to hear it played, but you can't just go out and hire a bunch of musicians. Most of us don't want to spend that kind of money or don't have it to spend to hear what your arrangement sounds like. So if you're lucky enough to find opportunities to hear your arrangements played by good players, and they don't have to be world-class professional players, but good players, you will learn so, so much just by the experiential end of it. And, uh, and you need to be patient for that to happen because it's not, you can't create opportunities uh, out of thin air. So um, that would be one thing that I would to say to all you guys. I certainly would say that no matter what 
aspect of the business you're in. You guys are all doing film score work, which encompasses a lot of different eras and styles of music. It is vital that you have a good background in theory. Um, I presume you're all doing some work in theory or have done some work in theory, but I can't say enough how vital it is to, to know your theory really, really well. I, I, if it, I don't care whether you're in super high uh, contemporary work or more classical sounding film score kind of stuff, but knowing theory, I think is really, really, really vital. And if there's any way you can have keyboard skills, I think that's also something that is so, so very important because that's the one instrument that encompasses the entire range of the instruments. It enables you to hear not only harmonic uh, and melodic elements, but rhythmic elements. Um, so having some keyboard skills, I really, really think is vital. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a, a nuts and bolts piece of it. Yeah, thank you for that. Because um, as a composer, you know, in film, everybody has this, you know, I dream of being, you know, the next composer for a great film. And, and I guess when I really stepped back and thought about the job, it really encompasses all sorts of techniques. Because like composing is such a small section of it, you know, because then you also have to go up and maybe conduct your your group and then you have to come up and orchestrate parts for your group. And if you're in like a low budget film, which a bunch of students are going to, including myself, are going to be doing in our next decade of work, you know, all these skills matter a lot. And so I was really interested in speaking with someone that had those skills because we speak to a lot of people that have lots of great interns that are really good at these things and they get to do the composing. And so, you know, these are all skills that everyone needs to make sure that they have a really good grip on before that they, you know, enter the workforce. And then I wanted to ask, um, we last, yesterday we talked about a little bit the concept of technology and how um, we talked about the situation where composers, young composers especially, um, have lots of power to compose a symphony kind of right at their desk, but maybe some of the up like downsides to that as well we talked about. I was hoping you could speak on that. Right. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think that this is a, it sort of links into what I was talking about a little earlier, and that is that hearing your work played by live musicians is, is such an eye opening and, and, an educational experience. I, I think that what is unfortunately the case, uh, just from an economic point of view, is if you're doing a, if you're composing a score, a film score that has a, a symphonic palette to it, you can easily, with the software out there, uh, write in, um, you can even do it with, with digital notation or, or notation software and hear the work that you've done with instrument samples ascribed to the lines. And it can sound terrific to you. And you go, wow, that's great. I've, I've done a beautiful job here. And then you can go into a live session with, with musicians sitting there and find out that half of the stuff you wrote is unplayable because it's out of the range of the instrument or that the, that the instruments don't really sound coloristically in live session the way you are able to manipulate it on your software. So um, yeah, Laura, that's what we, one thing we were talking about, having, developing a knowledge of what those instruments can do technically, what their ranges are, what their colors are, and what they sound like combined with, with each other is really, really important. Well, that's easy for me to say, sure, just uh, go out and learn that. Well, it's, it's not so easy to learn that. I mean, I think one, one way of, of going about it is I'm sure you guys all have friends who are instrumentalists who play different instruments, whether it's strings or winds or brass or percussion, but to take some time with people, friends that you know who play and learn as much as you can about the instruments because knowing the ranges and the colors and the technical um, elements of what they do is so, so important. Even, even notation work, knowing how to, to 
put together parts for your individual players that are easily readable, that are laid out correctly with good page turns. And these are all things that, that yes, a lot of us have resources. Uh, maybe you've got a librarian uh, on, the, on the gig or the date that you're working on that will do this work. But knowing all of that yourself is really, really important because what you want to do is go into a live session having uh, approached it from an informed point of view. You're always going to be surprised. I am still surprised to this day uh, doing a full symphonic orchestration and, and hearing something and saying, wow, I did not expect that to sound that way. But um, the more you can uh, arm yourself with great knowledge, and it takes time. I'm not being naive. I'm not saying this happens overnight. But if you have knowledge of what the instruments do, how they sound individually and together, and having your, uh, your sense of what to expect being nourished each time you go in, that's going to be vital to, to your success as a, as a composer. Yeah, I, I love all that. Thank you. Um, my next question would be, so you have, you know, arranged lots of composers' works, you've orchestrated lots of their pieces, you've conducted lots of their pieces. What are some things that stick out to you that make or break a composer, like some, whether some skill sets or even, you know, personality traits or attributes or just like how they interact in the workforce that where you go, oh, wow, they've really done well in this area or people where you've maybe gone, oh, I'm not sure about this. You know, maybe you could speak on kind of like your relationship with composers because we're going to have to, as composers, have relationships with these people, these skill sets like you all the time because they're going to be what kind of bring our work to life. Sure, sure. Well, one thing you guys all, of course, need to know uh, or need to be working on is doing so, so much listening and studying of the, of the master craftspeople in your business. I mean, John Williams is, is way up there, but there's so many um, uh, that have, have really great skill sets. I think that it's, before you even study the, the great film score composers of our time, I think it's really important that you study all of the composers, not all, <laughs> you're not gonna have time to study all of them. But in other words, know, know as much as you can, have a, a, as much of a sense as you can of the great masters of, of, of symphony music um, because so much of what you're going to be doing is applying a language to your work. Your, the, the visual piece of film scoring is, is front and center with what you guys are dealing with. You're watching action images on the screen and hopefully you're, you're drawing out of your vocabulary of knowledge of, of uh, classical music and film music that is going to allow you to use that language and apply it to the visuals that you're looking at. It is, it's so, so important that you have a vocabulary and a language to draw from. And as I say, it's, uh, as I've said probably too many times already, that's not gonna happen overnight. But listening to the great masters, to Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, up through Stravinsky, Ravel, uh, the opera composers, putting a vocabulary into your mind so that when you see an image, you have a voice based on vocabulary to draw on. Because and, and as you guys well know, writing film music is a, is a pretty limiting thing. You've got cues that last for could be, you know, 20 second cue or, or up to a four or five minute cue that you're trying to apply language to, to capture that image from a musical point of view. The more vocab you have, the more you can draw from thing, uh, music that you've listened to, the more you'll be able to concentrate on synthesizing that into your imagery and I think that having that background is, is 
super, super vital to that work. Thank you very much. So we are, we have about five-ish minutes, a little more like five to seven. Does anyone, now we're gonna open up the, oops. We're gonna open up everyone to questions. So does anyone have some questions they wanna ask? It could be questions about um, anything, anything that which is, you know. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I do actually. Um, and first of all, just thanks for being here, Mr. Mansfield. This has been, um, this, it's been great to hear all these things. Um, I'm one of the online master's students in film scoring. Um, and actually for me, like I'm in my early forties and um, this is a second master's for me. Um, I actually have a DMA in piano performance and I'm curious, um, as somebody who has a lot of experience as a performer and a strong theory background and comfortable arranging, I'm wondering if you might be able to help us um, sort of figure out how to, uh, especially in my case, how I might sort of investigate doing some work as a performer in this field, session work, or maybe breaking into doing some arranging, like what are some good approaches or tactics or um, and thanks ahead of time. Sure. Are you Sal or Salvatore? Yes. Sal's fine. Sal. Thanks. Great, great to meet you. Thank you. You too. Um, this is a really great question because uh, I will tell you that from my perspective, the work that I've gotten has almost exclusively been through contacts that I have. I mean, I don't think it's an it's the type of business where you can go online and look for job listings. Uh, my, to go back to my, when I started working with Boston Pops, it's probably as good an example as any. I was studying conducting uh, at the time with a, a, the man here in Boston named Newton Wayland, which is a crazy name. If you're from the Boston area, you know that there are two towns in the Boston area. One is Newton and the other is Whalen. So it's a crazy name that this man had. He came from California, so it had nothing to do with it. Anyway, he was, I was studying conducting and, and a little bit of arranging with him, but he was at the time working for the Boston Symphony and the Boston Pops. So he recommended me when they needed a pianist for this gig that I wound up finding out that John Williams was gonna be the conductor for it. Um, and I, and I would say that that is a real exemplary scenario of how I've gotten most of my work. And that is through knowing people or working with people in the business who then recommended me for something else. I guess the, the, the takeaway from this is that it, it's a great thing to do if you can meet a lot of people and at your all of your young age if you can make it known that you are really interested in getting into this business and that you're willing to help and do anything that anybody might come up with surrounding being surrounded by people who are working in the business is probably for me anyway been about 95% of the way I've gotten work. I mean, you know, the story that I told you, Sal, that, that when I was playing piano for Boston Pops that time, and then a couple of days later, John Williams called me into his office and said that the last second they needed some arranging work. Well, he didn't really know how, whether I was a great arranger I, or not, but I was in the right place at the right time. That, that, yeah, that's probably the best thing to say to you guys. Being in the right place at the right time is, is far more likely a path to getting work in this business than going on job listings and trying to find things out. And being available and, oh my gosh, being a really great person to be around, you know, somebody that people want to be in the same room with you, uh, these are, are vital things. I wish I could, Sal, I wish I could tell you that there's, there's a list of things I can tell you exactly what to do but that's, that's just not the way it works. At least that's not my experience. Right. I really is just sort of being in the right place at the right time and surrounding yourself or being surrounded by people 
who are already in it a little bit. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, when I was young, I said, I said yes to anything that anybody wanted me to do. I didn't turn anything down. Um, and, you know, to my detriment at times, but, but still, um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of a whiffy answer, but that's, that's the way it's happened for me. I understand. No, I appreciate it. And one last quick thing. A lot of people have said to me, um, you know, oh, join a musician's union. How useful or beneficial do you think that is? Is that a good way of making contacts? Or do you feel like it's one of those things that, you know, uh, could be useful or could not be? I actually think it's a great idea. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sorry if I'm boring you guys with this. No, awesome stuff, great. I had to join the Boston Musicians Union, EMA, mm -hmm. which is an affiliated with the AFM, um, American Federation of Musicians. I had to join when I got my first piano gig at Boston Pops because you were required to be in the union to play with Boston Pops, and you still are. So I, I did join then. Honestly, right now in my work as a conductor and arranger um, and composer, uh, you do, I do not have to be in the union to do what I'm doing. But I do feel that there's a connectivity of the top musicians in any given, wherever you guys are living. And just having your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the professional music world, which of course right now for all of us, it's just a catastrophic mess because of COVID. But, yeah. but when things are back up and running, and they will be, as we know, having that network of people who are really doing most of the professional playing, I think is a great way to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on. It's not that expensive. I think it's 150 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. Remember the, I know for Boston musicians, that's what it is. I think that's a worthwhile investment because you okay. do get weekly newsletters and you just feel like you're connected to the people who are really doing the top level pro work. I advise it. I, I advise doing it. Okay. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you, Sal. Okay. And then someone next, we have one more question. I think we'll have time for two if we can make these a little bit brief. So we have Tyler who has a question. And if someone else has a question, can you type it in the chat, please? Yeah. Well, Tyler and then Santiago. And then I think we're going to have to cut it off. But we're going to have to make these a little bit brief. <laughs> Go sure. ahead. I'm Hi. Hey, as long as you need me to stay Lauren, by the way, so that, don't worry about it. Yeah, me. well, we have a we have a French horn player coming in like five, four to six minutes. So we just um because speaking about learning about musicians, we have a French horn player coming to teach us about their instrument. Well, that's a good one too. We have two Tyler. more questions. Yeah. And Tyler, go first. Hello, thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I wanted to ask a little bit about connections. So. Going to Berkeley College of Music, um, I'm not too worried about getting connections with musicians. There's like a huge alumni network and a huge network of musicians here. I am, however, concerned, you know, going into this uh, film of film score or this field of film scoring. And also you talked about musical theater. I'm very interested in writing and orchestrating for musical theater. I'm wondering um, if having connections with musicians is equally or even less important than having connections with uh, people like directors or uh, like playwrights or actors or things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it depends on what the gig is, Tyler. You know, if you're, if uh, I, since I've been doing a lot of musical theater more recently, I would say that the connections with directors yeah. and choreographers um, are probably your A number one path to, okay. uh, to, uh, you know, to doing that, that kind of work. And we're, we, we must talk about location because um, as, as you guys all know, uh, the, the musical theater world is pretty much still New York centric and the film world is still pretty much LA centric, at least as far as I know, although there's the, the, the digital world has changed and, and broadened out those borders a little bit, but um, but I would definitely say from the musical theater point of view that uh, knowing and, and being in contact with directors um, is important. Listen, if you, if you know people who are working on musical theater projects themselves as composers or authors, those are certainly good people 
to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can tell you that Lin-Manuel Miranda, um, one of his closest friends for many years has been Alex Lacamoire, who I think is a Berkeley grad, right? Yeah. And so, duh, who was, who was Lynn going to have to arrange and orchestrate Hamilton, but, Lynn, but, but Alex, right? So yeah. those are the kinds of, of connections that really make a difference. I, I'm not, as I mentioned when I talked to Lauren, I'm not so connected into the film world, but I can't imagine that, that your, your best uh, beeline would be into directors and producers in that world too as opposed to musicians who are playing for the film scores. Probably yeah. not as, as good a connectivity. Um, but I don't want to go on too long, but that, that would be my impression. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, of course. All right, and our last question, an art friend horn player just dropped by. His name's Nick, so everybody say hey. Um, hey Nick. He'll be here, he has his French horn out, so. Get ready. Um, but then Santiago, you can go ahead and ask your question and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, we can't hear you. Santiago, you must be muted. He's unmuted, but we don't hear anything coming from your microphone. Do you wanna type it in the chat really quick? Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 yes. there you are. Oh, yeah. Oh, all right. uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, uh, perhaps a specific question of the craft. You, you spoke like uh, getting, yes, our, one of our biggest challenges is to get out of the computer and go into real musicians for our arrangements. I was wondering how was your process? I imagine you didn't wrote, write for 60 musicians for the first time in your first arrangement. How was that process of perhaps writing for smaller ensembles until the day you got to write to a very big ensemble? Right, good question, really great question. Uh, the first, the very first arranging I did was for um, a cappella singing. Uh, it happened to be all men a cappella singing because I went to a high school that was all men, all boys at the time. So my very first arrangement was for four parts uh, a cappella men's singing, and I think I remember doing a Beach Boys song. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Beach Boys. Probably some, but not all. Anyway, yeah, Franco, you've got your thumb up. I see that. Good. So that was the first thing, Santiago. And then the next thing that happened to me was I got a job that I mentioned at Harvard the year after I graduated from Harvard with this show called The Hasty Pudding Show, which had a band, a, a small orchestra of, of six horns and rhythm section. So three brass, three doubling reeds, piano, bass, and drum. And I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. But my mentor, who was a wonder, I mentioned him earlier, a wonderful conductor and arranger from New York, who was the principal arranger for Boston Pops at the time. He was my mentor and I learned from him. I, I literally learned from looking over his shoulder. All of what we were doing in those days was handwritten. It was all handwritten on big score paper. And I, I just stumbled my way along. My first few, few songs were just horrific. But I learned because I heard the players play it and I realized what I was sucking at and, and what worked out okay. So it did expand up that way. And my first orchestra arrangement was for a, a, a young audience program for, with, with a small professional symphony orchestra, but it did have all of the elements, strings, winds, brass, percussion. And again, I, I did work that was, that sounded like somebody who had never done the work before, but I, it, it wasn't horrible. And so I learned so quickly on the job, which is why I've been saying all along that if you have a chance to be in the environment where you can hear your work played, that is the very best thing that can happen to you. But yes, for all of you, I imagine you're gonna start or you're already starting with smaller ensembles, at least from a live point of view. If you're doing digital sequencing, you can lay up a whole big orchestra, but you're not hearing it being played live. That's the, that's the, um, you know, the double-edged sword to that. Well, thank you so much. It was so great having you. Oh my goodness. We've Everybody all... could give a virtual clap. That would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> great to see you all. Right. Guys. Good thank luck you. to all of you. Thank 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 you.
keep your spirits up and be hopeful and, and do everything you possibly can to surround yourself with, with your music. Uh, and good things will happen. Good things will happen. Thank you so much. It was, so, it was so great having you. It was so nice to see you again. I look forward to seeing you again. You bet, Lauren. Quicker. Great to see you again as well. Good luck to all of you guys. Stay Thank well. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So Thank you. Before we move on, um, Grace Mary has a quick announcement for all the uh, graduate students. Grace, would you like to give us the uh, message? Hi. Hi guys, so I'm the Berkeley Online Representative. I wanted to just reach out and say that I'm going to create a group for the online grad students um, all the semesters, it doesn't matter what semester, and I'm going to create a group so that we could have our own Zoom meetings every so often so that we could network, meet each other, and talk about what we're learning. Great. Fantastic. And also, before we move on to Nick with the French horn, um, next week we're going to be sending out a newsletter with an invitation to a Discord for everyone. Um, I thought it'd be a cool idea for all of us to be on Discord because we can have different categories for people sharing music and talking about composers that we like. And I think it'll be a really nice forum for all of us to sort of connect with each other online in these difficult times. So look out for that. If you're not a user of Discord, hopefully this will introduce you to Discord and we can start, you know, building community and it'd be really nice. Um, so without further ado, I think we have someone who's about to show us about what I would consider to be the, an instrument, which is the titan of film scoring. Um, Nick, all the way from Germany, is going to teach us a bit about French horn. Nick, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so this will be a little bit improvised because <laughs> this has been a very short notice, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick and I've been um, studying at Berkeley since uh, fall 2019. And uh, as a French horn player at Berkeley, you immediately get uh, drafted into literally every single orchestra uh, that exists uh, at Berkeley, which was actually awesome. And I met a lot of people. And and I also had a lot of experience playing uh, original compositions from different film scoring students. And there were some really great moments, but there are also some moments I might use as examples for how not to do it, <laughs> uh, how not to write for French horn. Uh, and that's why I'm going to give you a little bit of a basics lesson today. Um, so I don't know just the, at the very beginning a French horn is basically just a really long tube that's been rolled up. It's like some like around six meters long. And uh, the, uh, you can basically compare it to like here in Germany, a lot of my other French horn friends actually play the Alphorn. Alphorn is, I don't know if you've heard of that, like a really long wooden tube and you use it to, uh, play in the mountains to give signals to others. And uh, even though you don't have any valves and you can't, it doesn't seem like you can really play anything uh, lyrical, the higher you go up, the smaller the intervals get in between the notes. And the same goes with this horn. The higher I go without playing anything, the intervals get so small that I can play a melody in uh, the key that my horn is tuned to. In this case, uh, I have a double horn, which is basically the standard horn that almost every professional French horn player has. It's a mix of a B flat horn and an F horn. We notate everything in F, but uh, in Germany, when I, when I just play the normal valves, the three valves over here, uh, I'm in B flat. The American horns are the other way around. You play, it's uh, by default in F, and then there's a switch for the thumb, and you can switch to either F horn or B flat horn, depending what model you have. And uh, this gives me the chance to actually switch between two different tube lengths in the in the instrument. So the F horn is actually a lot longer than the B flat horn. So whenever I play really high, uh, the B flat 
tube is a little bit shorter, so the intervals up high are not as close together as they were if I played with the longer F horn tube. That gives me a lot of advantages that I can just have a little bit more of a safer tone on the top. Um, for example, I'll just show you a little bit. If I play, if I don't touch anything, like the the lower I go, the the larger the intervals get, and uh, in this case, French hornists back in the day were not able to play any melodies down low because there was no way to actually play any intervals in between. And now I can actually just. Go down pretty low and play in, uh, yeah, play any note I want. And uh, which is great because now my range uh, in like chromatics goes uh, over uh, four octaves actually. So if you, if I play down really low, like I was just playing, I'm, I'm around like uh, two, two lines below the uh, bass clef in, in F. So that's also another fifth below, I think. <laughs> um, and if I go up, I can go up uh, two ledger lines above uh, above the treble clef. And then I can go up. And uh, that's kind of the average range for someone who has been playing for quite some time, please don't write something that's constantly up in that higher range because it gets very, very strenuous for French horn players. Since our, uh, our mouthpiece is not like a trumpet piece, the, the inside actually goes down pretty, pretty far down. You know, I don't know if you've seen or if you play trumpet maybe, you know that uh, the area inside is a lot more shallow. And so your lips pierce in a lot easier. But in this case, uh, the, since we're playing in so many different ranges, the, our lips have to have more room to vibrate. And that makes it a lot more strenuous for us to play really high parts for a long time because uh, we don't have the support from the mouthpiece as uh, trumpet players do. And uh, French horn players in general play more in the middle range. And so our lips are just not set to play like a big band trumpet player. And I've had moments where, uh, where some people gave me music to, to sight read and it's just constantly in that high like high F range and, and there's no way I can play something like that without having any time to, I don't know, warm up and practice and everything. Um, so keep it more in the mid range, but if you have a solo section that's really important, feel free to go up a little bit higher and, uh, and especially if the uh, player has some more time to prepare, uh, he'll really enjoy having a moment to shine because if you practice then it'll sound a lot better but you know how often you have sessions where you just give someone the music on the spot and you have 15 minutes to record something there's no way uh, we're able to play it perfectly right away and and we sometimes have like five other people recording after us and it's not it's not like we're only playing your piece. So keep that in mind if you're part of a pretty big session that sometimes the film scoring orchestra is like a six hour long recording session. And uh, so I'll be sitting in the booth for six hours and different composers come in and, uh, and give me their music, just a 15 minute quick thing. But if everything ends up being super strenuous, 
there's no way that the last people getting to record get a very high quality recording. Um, uh, so maybe I can say something about uh, ways to write and maybe add French horn into your ensemble. French horn is often not considered a sole brass instrument. Maybe you've heard a lot of people say that you can actually combine it with woodwinds a lot. And so last semester I actually played in a woodwind ensemble. I was the only person playing a brass instrument. But since French horn has a very soft and mellow tone compared to uh, trumpet or tuba or uh, trombone, you can often just add it into a soul woodwind ensemble and it'll mix pretty well. Um, um, but it all depends how you want the French horn is to play because you can also have a French horn play super brassy like you know in film music when you have like eight horns playing at the same time uh, in Lord of the Rings and it doesn't sound at all mellow and nice sometimes. And that's the great thing. You can, you can write in a like triple fortissimo and then the French hornist will know uh, I, I have to play really strong and loud. But if you play something super nice and soft, it'll almost go in the direction of a bassoon from, from the sound. So there's a big variety of um, tone quality that you can uh, uh, yeah, get out of this one instrument, which is great, but also a little bit complicated if you have to decide what, what do you want. But it's great just trying things out. If you have someone, if you have, know a French horn player, just give him a little excerpt and, and ask him to play and you can, you can hear uh, what, what kind of sound you want. If you want it to be a little bit stronger, then it's, it's always good. And it seems very professional if someone comes up to you. It's, it doesn't seem like you're uncertain. It seems, it seems really cool if I'm, if I'm just walking down the hallway and someone comes up to me and says, oh yeah, could I, I just want to hear if that sounds uh, the way I imagine it to sound. Because if you only have the electric Sibelius finale French horn sound in your head, you, you end up composing things or not composing things for certain instruments just because you have this really bad sound in your ear. So go ahead and just, just ask because we'll be, we'll be really happy to help you out. And it's always fun playing new music. So don't be scared. Um, maybe I could talk about some extended technique quickly. So basically you have, you have unlimited options in some degree. If you're like, I, I had to blow in the horn sometimes just to make like air sounds uh, or, or just like, uh, like, um, hitting the vowels really strong that makes a like sound but you can sometimes hit on the top of the the uh, French horn and it it actually creates different notes it's a little bit hard to hear but it if I if I play a scale it's I have a shitty microphone so <laughs> you might have not heard anything I just did but uh, in here, it sounds like I'm actually going down the scale uh, while hitting this. I don't know if <laughs> you're hearing this. Um, of course, we have flutter tongue. That's, that's pretty commonly used, even if even in like older pieces that you... You basically just trill your tongue, and uh, if if you're doing something a little bit more modern, or you want you want some dissonance in the note that the note shouldn't sound too clear, that's always fun to do, and really simple. It's not like you can just throw it in anywhere, and it's not a big uh, difference. Actually, playing with mutes is also fun because. Uh, it's not too over the top, like with trumpets that you have like so many different kinds of mutes. 
but you, we just basically have two mutes. And one is the normal mute uh, that you would mostly use just to mellow down the sound. It compared to the actual sound. It, it just narrows down the the sound, but it, it's, it sometimes sounds great if you have a really quiet moment in your piece and you still want a French horn solo, but you don't want it to be too direct and too out there. You can just uh, write in uh, mute and, uh, uh, and you'll, uh, and you just play the whole solo with a mute in. And if everyone's playing really quiet, uh, it'll sound really interesting and it's uh, it's also nice for the French horn player you can play with a little bit of a different sound than your average French horn sound. Um, a stop mute for example looks something like this sometimes it, it looks a little bit different this is a really old one so it might look newer if you see it somewhere else. Um, we basically uh, the way you write and stop notes is by putting a plus over it most of the time over your note and so I know I can if it's just one note if I play a normal note and then a stop note right away and then I switch right away back to playing normally I can actually do that with my hand I can just I have my hand in the French horn the whole time and I can control the uh, the sound and pitch a little bit with my hand but if I stop the, the inside and I just plug the back of my horn, I can play more of a really brassy sound. Um, like, uh, I don't know, maybe you can imagine it like if uh, for example, in American in Paris that you'll have the car honking or something. That always sounds very similar. Um, but if there, sometimes there are longer um, uh, phrases or, or parts where you just don't want to have your hand stuck in the whole time and it's, you can't make a perfect seal with your hand it's just kind of a quick uh, um, way of uh, doing it if you don't have that much time. But otherwise, you can add the stop mute. It's a little bit, I, I guess, a little bit clearer just because you can have a tight seal and, and this is really controlling uh, the different sound. Um, and oh, Nick, sorry, I, I think we're going to have to end the meeting soon. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank no, you so much. I, you yeah, OK. Oh, my goodness. Basically, like I'm a okay. of you. Who found that like so informative? Because I learned like a million yeah. things just now. I was I, looking at the faces of some people. I and had, like, my notes yeah, and people were like, so amazed. <laughs> I think I actually just finished my list. So it's Yay. perfect. Thank Everybody you so much. Give Nick a round of applause. That was amazing. Thank you. That's what we're talking Thank about. Thank you. Yeah, so don't be scared, but also uh, be nice to the French horn players in the <laughs> session room. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, okay. For it. everyone coming next week, we're meeting with two Emmy-winning directors. Um, they're documentary directors. They're going to be here next week to talk about the process of shooting, and they're going to be here to talk about their relationship with composers. Um, yeah, so look forward to seeing you all here. Someone says that was amazing. Lots of people in the chat saying thank you so much, Nick. Shout out to Nick. This has been recorded. So if anyone wants to remember what Nick said, because all of it was just solid gold, we will be putting this in our social media platform. Thank you guys so much for coming and we will see you next week. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
should we leave it? Oh.